Hello, it's Scott Manley here. You've probably heard of this guy. Well, I want to talk about the very first space venture that he, he got involved in. Now, if you watched my video a few days ago about lesser known Soviet rockets, you'll know that he tried and failed to buy some Soviet ICBMs so that he could put a greenhouse on the surface of Mars. This project called Mars Oasis had a lot of uh, smart people involved in it. And in the study I read, they thought they could do this for $38 million. And that would include two launches by these former Soviet missiles. And so I thought it would be fun to go back to the earliest days of this YouTube channel and build this in Kerbal Space Program, or at least an approximation of it. To be clear, the proportions and scaling on this are all off. It's very hard to miniaturize the probe. But I can build something that is broadly similar with, you know, similar first stage, second stage, and uh, the third stage, which has to do the backflip to get into orbit. Now, because of, you know, how difficult it is to pack things into very small spaces, this rocket is a teensy bit bigger than the real thing. So the Dnieper launch vehicle started life as an SS-18 Mod 5, uh, you know, ICBM. It was designed to lob very large warheads from the Soviet Union into the USA. And after the end of the Cold War, it was part of arms reductions treaties. And so it was converted into a launch vehicle. And in that guise, it was able to put about three and a half tons into low Earth orbit. That made it comparable to the Delta II rocket. But to get the fullest out of its payload capability, it had to perform an unusual trick. It had to reverse into orbit. You see, the upper stage was designed to retarget the multiple warheads, and it was maneuverable, but uh, its thrusters would fire in reverse. So after it got to a suborbital insertion, it would then have to separate off the nose fairing, it would separate off the second stage, and then the whole spacecraft would flip through 180 degrees so that it could then continue on its way to orbit. I mean, sure, it does seem like a kind of weird maneuver, but it was an off-the-shelf part, more or less, and it was one of the things they didn't have to build. Everything else had to be developed specially for this mission. Now, the team that worked on the study involves a bunch of people you might have heard of. There was uh, Mike Griffin, uh, Jim Cantrell, who, of course, was uh, Vector Space and now Phantom Space. There were, there were companies like Ecliptic Enterprises and Paragon Space Development. And then a lot of the hardware would be designed and built at uh, the Space Dynamics Laboratory at the University of Utah. And then, of course, there was the Russian and Ukrainian teams who would provide the rocket and the insertion stage that would take the spacecraft from low Earth orbit onto its Mars transfer trajectory. So this was a derivative of the Breeze upper stage, which is in use today. It was just under three tons and it used bipropellant thrusters. So there were four propellant tanks, two oxidizer, two fuel, and four engines, each engine providing 150 kilograms of thrust. Now, they had actually investigated using an American-built solid rocket motor on there. Uh, that would have worked just as well, but the liquid thruster gave them more versatility and more ability to fine-tune the final trajectory after insertion to make sure that they were you know, going to maximize the performance of the cruise stage. So when the study was written in 2001, they expected that uh, they would be ready for launch in 2005. Now, there were Mars windows in that year, starting at the end of uh, July and going all the way through to the middle of September. So they would preferably launch early on because that would get them on a type one trajectory, which would only take 200 days. But if they took a bit longer, they would be on a trajectory that would take like a whole year. It would have slightly lower delta V requirements but the shorter one was preferred because they had a biological payload and they would want to make sure that it was minimi you know, to minimize its exposure to deep space radiation and stuff. Either way, the spacecraft would launch from Baikonur, go into a parking orbit, and then over multiple orbits, the uh, transfer stage would raise the orbital eccentricity, lifting the spacecraft higher and higher up until it was ready to make the final Mars insertion burn. And that would take them off on their voyage towards Mars.
With the departure burn complete, the large propulsion module is no longer needed. So that would be ditched and you would be left with the cruise stage attached to the descent stage. So the cruise stage would have minimum propulsion capabilities. I think they said 150 meters per second of delta V would be needed for like in-flight um, you know, course correction maneuvers. It would obviously have solar power, um, telemetry downlink, all that stuff to make sure that the actual descent capsule got sent on its course correctly. Now, it would also have to provide power to the descent module, which is having to keep the biological payloads alive. Unlike other Mars spacecraft, this is you know, the first time we'd be sending something into space for hundreds of days. And, uh, you know, obviously you don't want to get there and find that your plants are dead. The good news is that plants come in an easy, convenient package, which can be reconstituted after, you know, years of dormancy. Seeds. So the main requirement was to make sure that the spacecraft didn't get too hot or too cold. They didn't need to provide it like sustained environment to keep it alive. The US had previously sent uh, seeds into deep space aboard the Apollo missions. And of course, Apollo 14 brought back seeds to make the Apollo trees and those grew up just fine. But being in deep space beyond the Earth's magnetosphere for like six months, that was something which would be entirely new to this mission. And the good thing is that you would have multiple seeds, different varieties. Some might work, some may not. So after months in space, it's February 2006. Spacecraft is on final approach to Mars. The descent velocity will be about 7.1 kilometers per second. Cruise stage would have to be dropped just before descent. Obviously, it has like fragile solar panels. The descent capsule has a heat shield, a back shell, and it's you know pretty much based on things like the Pathfinder mission. And I am going to make it clear that the design that I have here is in no way a representative of the actual thing. So the proportions of this like heat shield, the geometry of the back shell, those are largely constrained by what I could easily do within Kerbal Space Program without mods. The real thing would have been a lot flatter. It would have had, you know, a much, it wouldn't have that big ridge around the back there. Prior to release, the cruise stage would have trimmed the descent. They would be aiming for like a 14 degree descent angle at an altitude of 125 kilometers. And unlike recent rovers, which were looking for very tight landing sites, this would have a landing ellipse of something like 200 kilometers long, 20 kilometers wide. They didn't care where exactly they landed on Mars beyond making sure that they landed in a region where the terrain was kind of flat and the altitude was pretty low because, of course, you want low altitude so you get thicker atmosphere and that gets you, you, know, that gets you to the surface more safely. And so typically that means that you would be landing in the northern hemisphere. If you've looked, Mars has like an asymmetric uh, you know, surface relief. The north has is much lower, the south is much higher. That's why most Mars missions end up landing in the northern hemisphere. Now, because this needed to be able to expose its payload to sunlight, it was fortunate that this was like the 2006 window because that would have made sure that it was summer in the northern hemisphere, therefore maximizing the amount of, of sun. If they had delayed this a couple of years, they, it might not have been ideal for the biological payload, so they might have had to wait another two years. So having survived the heat of re-entry, the spacecraft now is going to slow down in the atmosphere using a parachute. And that will deploy at supersonic speeds and eventually slow the spacecraft down to about 100 meters per second. And while this is happening, the forward heat shield would be ejected, exposing the pr uh, probe to the Martian atmosphere for the first time. And now while NASA had pioneered airbags for landing and they were looking at this crazy idea called the Sky Crane, this uh, Mars Oasis would use a more traditional direct descent based on rockets. Unlike those other missions, it wasn't that bothered about kicking up a lot of dust during the landing, which might contaminate sensors and stuff like that. So yeah, this would basically float down under a parachute and once it reached the target altitude, it would drop out of its casing and then perform a final descent down to the surface under rocket power. And yeah, in my Kerbal version, it didn't go quite as smoothly as I expected. Another thing I wanted to make sure was I wanted to orient my experiment package so that it faced south, so that we'd be able to get in the sun. But the, the real one actually had a dome which would work in any orientation, if I understand it correctly. 
And so if all that worked out, this would represent the first privately funded spacecraft to land on another world, which would be amazing in and of itself. But at the core of this mission was the idea of Mars Oasis. They wanted plants to be growing on the surface of Mars. So they needed a greenhouse that would work for this specific application. As I said, one of the things they had to do during flight was keep the temperatures low and you know stop it getting too hot so that the seeds would survive. But now they got here, they needed to warm it up to operating temperature. One of the interesting things I note in the study is they pointed out that for flight, they had to secure the greenhouse to the spacecraft rigidly to stop it vibrating around. But once they landed, they actually needed to sever these mechanical links because too much heat would be conducted through those structural members. So after landing, they would like fire these like guillotines that would you know, detach it. And then the spacecraft's greenhouse would basically be suspended by some springs and like a, so your cables for power. So yeah, I do have images of what the greenhouse would look like. It would be like a glass dome with a pair of hemispheres over the top. So they could rotate these to whatever orientation so that they could capture the sun during the middle of the day and then close them up to keep the heat inside at night. The seeds would be like pre-planted in like egg carton style things with a gel growth medium and they would be kept dry until they were ready to start growing. At the back of the chamber, there would be a set of electronics to control the lights, life support and heating. And importantly, there would also be cameras and lights because, of course, they wanted to take photos and send those back to Earth and inspire future generations to look at Mars as a destination for humanity's future. And there would also be an external camera that could take pictures of the greenhouse from the outside. So yeah, I mean, they get to the surface, their whole goal is they've got maybe a month to actually demonstrate plant growth. They um, are, they would start warming up the greenhouse, ascertain where they are on the surface, make sure that everything's oriented in the correct uh, direction. They would demonstrate that the thermal controls on the greenhouse were within the range needed to sustain life because you didn't want to start them growing until you were sure that you could keep them alive. And then by maybe day three, that would be when the water would be introduced. It would basically be a tank of water in the back. Uh, hopefully it wouldn't be frozen, otherwise we'd have to thaw it out. But yeah, it would just pour the water on. And from that point on, they would make sure the uh, dome opened during the day to provide light. They would have to make sure it didn't get too hot in the midday sun because that was totally a you know, possibility. Um, but it would then largely be a process of waiting. They would expect the first shoots to appear maybe, you know, within eight to ten days. And depending on the crop, depending upon the amount of light that they were getting, you would get some growth in the chamber and they would get their photographs of life on Mars. Because of the small chamber, they would have to select special dwarf varieties of common crops. You know, they, they could actually have dwarf varieties of things like tomatoes and lettuce or rice, things that would actually, you know, be familiar to people around the world. But resources inside the greenhouse are somewhat limited, and although plants are supposed to photosynthesize and run the life cycle and replenish the atmosphere, you know, they uh, also had to deal with the potential of uh, planetary protection rules, and so they weren't really supposed to leave anything alive on Mars. Uh, and so the idea, I think, was that after the plants started to get old and started to slow down, they would... Um, well, they would begin to bring the experiment to a close. And one of the things they would do before closing this up is they would actually take photos of the plants at night. They would open up the dome, turn on the lights, get some shots, and then close it up. They wanted to do this quickly because, of course, that would cause the temperature in the chamber to drop pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, once the plants had really started to die off, they would make sure that there was no seeds that would come out of this. They would have, like, uh, like a biocide that they would inject in. And then that would be the end of the biological mission. The spacecraft could continue to operate. It had cameras on board. It may have had other sensors, depending upon how much they could get on board. But that would be the end of Mars Oasis. But hopefully the start of a future of life on Mars. But of course that never happened. The rockets were simply too expensive for this small project. And instead of taking that 40, 50 million dollars that he had sitting around to you know, build a space probe uh, and put it on someone else's rockets, Elon decided to take that money and build his own rockets. 
And now he has more than three and a half tons of payload to low Earth orbit. Maybe Mars Oasis might once again emerge in some form. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.